V8I system. It was the MCAMs. Right, right. MCAMs, wow. Yeah, it's on the, uh, the historical wall of display in the UK of all the old cameras. <laughs> there are websites I have. that maybe I can identify what we used. <laughs> I think I have an MCAM somewhere around here. They're that old, there's no pictures on Google of them. <laughs> V8i, yeah? Yeah. yeah. It's the MCAM series. Andy Ray just reminded us that it was installed by Alex Muir. Yeah. Really? It was the first, that was the first Vicon um, technician that I met in person was Alex Muir, who came, came down to Portsmouth and, and set up a, a whopping six camera system. <laughs> wow. That was a big deal at the time. Yeah. Alex, Alex Muir is a, an interesting story and dedication because when he came to apply for the job at Vicon, he bought a one-way plane ticket. Wow. Really? <laughs> yeah, there was, there was no going home. Awesome. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So thanks everybody for joining us for the third and final session in the Vicon industry panel webinar series. Today, we are hosting a live panel discussion and Q&A on all things motion capture education. We have five awesome Vicon customer panelists here. So thank you all for making the time and joining us for the conversation. I'm really excited. I will give everybody a chance to introduce themselves and then Jeff will take it away with the discussion. We will be covering five or so topics, eight to 10 minutes on each, like the previous panels, um, and then taking your questions at the end. So the Q&A section is open. You can start submitting those now. Um, we'll get to those right at the end. I also have the YouTube stream going, so we can share the stream right away and I'll be looking for questions over there. Make sure to follow our social channels for information on upcoming sessions. I post all the details at vicon.com slash events. And if you're interested in being part of a future panel or a future webinar, you can always email me at marketing at vicon.com. So we will start with some introductions. We'll start with Alex. Um, tell us a bit about yourself, your background, including how you got into mocap and what system you learned on. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Alex. I work at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. Um, I've been working with mocap for Wow, 17 years now. And the first system I accessed, which I just had to check on, was a Vicon V8i with data station system that was installed by Alex Muir. <laughs> um, and there was six cameras sitting around. in a, It was intended in a VR room for tracking objects. Um, and I decided to kind of um, repurpose that for doing character and, and kind of animation. And we kind of started from there, really. So, yeah, Vicon IQ. Um, and then started just pushing the boundaries, buying more cameras when we could get them and building the system up until, you know, now we're on a 48 camera vantage system. So <laughs> come a long way. <laughs> One step at a time. Awesome. Yep. Thanks for joining us, Alex. Uh, Jesse, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi guys, I'm Jesse Woodward. Um, I'm here teaching at University of Wisconsin Stout here in Menominee, Wisconsin. And uh, I have approximately maybe three, four years of experience with uh, motion capture. Um, I initially started in undergrad during my senior year uh, when we finally, at least I could finally was able to use the system that was there. And it was a Vicon system. I can't remember what it was. It was fairly old. And that was back in like 2007, uh, 2008. And so um, we were kind of bumbling around because we had no instruction, no manual. And back in the day, there was no forums or anything, you know, from Vicon and it was blade too. It was, it was kind of rough. Um, but now, uh, about two years ago here at, uh, Stout, we have a brand new Vero system, um, much better software with Shogun and, uh, we couldn't be happier with it. So. Awesome. Glad to have you. Yep. Thank you. Um, uh, Carlos. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Carlos Vilches. Um, I'm in Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico City. Uh, it's funny because I have like 12 or 13 years teaching motion capture with Vicon system. The first one was uh, a T10 with a camera system in Universidad del Valle de Mexico. I have the chance to teach maybe in all the mock-up stages in Mexico City, like about 
UVM has six, um, and now University have two, and finally Tecnológico de Monterrey have seven. Uh, so it's like, you know, like a very funny history because I know all the mock-up stages in Mexico. I have the chance to teach in another universities in South America, like in Argentina and Colombia, they have motion capture systems too. Uh, and yes, as Jesse says, uh, at the beginning was very, very funny because we don't have an idea how to use it, you know, like 13 years ago. But uh, I'm very happy now. I'm doing my PhD uh, based also in motion capture things related. So I'm very happy to be here. And we're very happy to have you. Thank you. Uh, Nick? Hi, thanks. Uh, so my name's Nick. My last name's just too long to worry about. I teach at uh, Drexel University in Philadelphia, USA. And I wish I could remember the name of my the first mocap system I got to work with. It was actually a, a suit that had LED strobe lights on it. So instead of the strobes being around the lens of the cameras, the cameras were just uh, a lens without strobes and the strobe LEDs were actually on the suit itself and they were firing in sync with the frames of the camera. So I wish I could remember the name of that. Um, I do remember, I think, trying, there was a software called RealViz MatchMover Pro that if you had three, I, I think I used three mini DV cameras in my basement and managed to do some like cross crossing the streams to do a little bit of mocap with that. So, so that was all shortly after the 1900s were over. So it's, it's been a little while. Um, but these days, it's it's really nice. I, when I joined Drexel University, uh, it's almost 10 years ago now, uh, they already had a uh, Vicon MX system in place. And of course, we've, we've since moved up to the, the Vantage system. And so we have that. And we have a smaller mocap system as well. That's, uh, it, well, it's not a Vicon system. But uh, it's, we have a few different mocap systems and inertial suits these days. Awesome. Welcome. And Stuart? Uh, hi, yes. So, uh, yeah, I'm Stuart Butler and I'm from uh, Staffs Uni in the UK. So I'm a course director for games technology at Staffs. Um, I've been teaching with mocap or working with mocap since, um, I've been teaching since 2009. I used it as a student prior and I've always used Vicon hardware. Um, the first system I worked on, I can't remember what it was, but when we visited Vicon in Oxford, um, Andy Ray kindly showed me the same system used as a doorstop for the factory. So um, to keep it cool, which um, possibly outlined how old that system was when we upgraded. So um, yeah, we're now on sort of um, a mixture of uh, Vero and Vantage stuff, which is really cool. Um, done some work with um, various facial setups, including Cara, which um, the original Cara that's on its last legs now. Um, uh, but yeah, so loads of awesome work. And a lot of my focus is um, is motion capture for for games and going through to kind of UE4 and that sort of stuff with it. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Ovadia. I'm the director of sales, marketing, and support for Vicon. I've been with the company for 13 years, and I came from a control systems engineering background working at Raytheon and graduated uh, from UC Santa Barbara. And yeah, 13 years is a long time, but it feels like just yesterday that I got, that I got started. And it's great because I, I had a passion, obviously, for engineering when I came in. But personally, I'm a big film and video game buff. So I am very excited to lead this discussion today. And we're just going to cover uh, five central topics as kind of themes behind all of the questions and discussions that we have, uh, kind of starting with the, the current state of motion capture and VFX and talking a bit about adaption and adoption, considering the times uh, that we're in, the future of animation itself, and then how we empower that vision, uh, as well as talking to our panelists about their personal hopes for the industry uh, and the future. So based on that, I'm gonna start with our first question. Uh, given the challenges and innovations that led us to this specific point in time and history, uh, what's your current take on the state of motion capture and animation right now? And anybody chime in at any point? Um, I'll chime in first, I don't mind. Um, I think it's kind of like they're golden times at the moment. It's it's amazing the, the, the prevalence of mocap, optical, inertial as a tool in industry education is huge. The uses are wide ranging and it seems to be getting more and more, which is great as far as educators, because that just 
means there's there's validation to our teaching and our and our and our students have got lots of options when they graduate. But I think it's it's a heyday. I think at the moment it's been great to see the increase. Anyone else kind of think the same? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think particularly motion capture itself is now becoming the you know it's a cornerstone technology for virtual production, which of course is really exploding now and um, the the tracking is going to be a major feeder for you know when when epic comes out with things like metahumans and everyone all of a sudden has free access to really good character rigs that have great shaders and they're able to generate characters quickly that's all fun until you you have to start moving them and so the fact that um you know, motion capture is a uh, very uh, authentic way of driving those characters. It's really good. And another thing that I'm really impressed with is there's a democratization going on with the overall technologies. I mean, we're really fortunate to have a, a top end system, you know, in, in our institutions. Um, but, you know, some of the times, you know, it's there's a bit of a learning curve in getting students up to speed on that. And today there's tools that will just use a single video camera. You can, you know, I think Radical is one of them where you, know, you shoot a video, you upload a video, a machine learning system processes it and comes out with a, a joint system, you know, that's, that's moving. And, you know, okay, it's not as accurate as, you know, a full-blown, you, know, uh, you know, feature grade, major studio grade optical system, but you've got an FBX file that you can start animating with and you can use that and you can, you know, start working on the downstream steps and, and then all of a sudden that leap to a full blown optical system isn't that big of a step. And so, yeah, it, there's, there's all sorts of really great things converging at this very moment. Yeah. I, I want to, I want to share my perspective, you know, here in Latin America, the things um, in the past used to be like if you have a motion capture system it's just because you're going to use it for you know make, uh, animate characters and you know uh, specific topics just in animation courses in the university but now it's amazing how the interest to get uh, this technology just because um, you know programs like media and uh, want to use it for virtual production uh, digital humans. Uh, so it's it's amazing how universities started to see that motion capture was more than just, you know, make a, a small characters move. It's more like a, a, a technology who will be along the process for a lot of technologies. And as you say, Nick, uh, uh, I think this uh, uh, things related to use in real engine will be a, a very uh, amazing match of technologies and ways to use motion capture and real-time graphics in a lot of uh, programs like architecture, uh, of course, animation, uh, virtual reality, etc. It's amazing. Yeah, there's a term we use a lot. It's that lowering that barrier to entry, and it's got a lot easier now to get involved in this stuff and and get in and get, you know, like you say, Nick, democratizing it. It's, it's much more available, it's easier to use for people. And that's a great thing because it just widens out that scope of what we can do with it in education. It's great. Yeah, I think, I think for us, one of the, the interesting things with, the, 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 with motion capture becoming more and more kind of commonplace and almost a household term now, is that we've got performers on uh, performing arts degrees or and things like that wanting to use and wanting to experience performance inside of a capture volume so actually finding finding talent is is a lot easier than it has ever been because we actually have students that are, are unnatural performers wanting to come and and try it out and and work with our students who perhaps aren't quite so um comfortable performing in, inside the volume a little bit perhaps rigid and you know I, i'm sure we all in the same situation with animation and motion capture that if the performance is is rigid the animation at, at the back is always going to be harder to get to that quality level so actually having having willing performers that are almost asking us for practice rather than us chasing them is, is has been a, a really big step for us and the departments inside the university wanting to put that experience as part of their course as well to bring us a, a whole range of, of actors and performances of performers of different sizes and kind of interest has been has been awesome 
I've really noticed that as well. I've, I'm getting approached by other universities that are teaching kind of, you know, acting and performance because they know they want to come to us. Um, and also uh, we've got performing arts and kind of drama courses and, and reaching out to them and getting more performers. But yeah, it used to be, yeah, it's nice to, like you say, um, Stuart, not to have the student performers because you know, maybe a game student isn't the best performer in the world. If I get one more capture of zombies, I think I think our library of zombie capture is fit to burst. Yeah. Yeah, I, I found some amazing performers from our from our game students, but they are few and far between. But sometimes there is some absolute golden beauties, particularly on witness cameras. Um, but yeah, so the perform like proper performers that are really kind of. Well, being trained for it is is, yeah. is brilliant. Yeah, and of course, the pandemic has also triggered uh, adoption from industries that haven't really been using it as much. Um, I don't know if you guys had seen the the Sony um, Madison Beer Boundless project that they had done, um, where you know she was all motion captured to create a full virtual concert. I think there's um, it's the company uh, Hyperreal is the company that was like made a digital version of her, and you know, then the concert is entirely digital. And I think it's already streamed once. And um, what was also fascinating to me about it is that if you look at some of the behind the scenes videos, there's a, a video of the motion capture director and he, he was not in the mocap studio. I'm not sure exactly where he was, but he was not at the studio, but he was wearing a VR headset and getting the live stream of the retargeted character and, you know, with a microphone, I guess, you know, talking with the performer, talking with her and giving her motion capture direction uh, from from some other location. And the fact that, you know, now he can watch a virtual version of the performer. He's not watching video. He's watching, you know, a, a, a digital version and able to see what she's doing in, in that space and, and communicate without having to get on an airplane and, and fly for some number of hours to, to get to this space. And um, another thing for us that was really interesting and within our own university, our dance department reached out to us because they were going to need to teach their dance classes remotely over Zoom. And you know they, they knew we had this motion capture system and, and look, is there anything that we can do? And we ended up uh, having just one or two dancers come in with the dance instructor, Sandra Parks, and she directed them through all the demonstrations for the entire semester of dance classes. And we just dropped them all into Motion Builder, taught, you know, Sandra, the dance instructor, here's how to scrub on the timeline in Motion Builder and how to pick between takes. And so now she could share her screen and just scrub through Motion Builder demos. She didn't have to find a position in her home, you know, at certain distance from the camera. And can you see how my foot's pointed and, you know, not be able to see her students because she's trying to demonstrate. Instead, she could just screen share motion capture data and show she had deliberately examples of good performance, examples of these are common mistakes. And then she could keep her attention. She could be sitting right at her desk, looking closely at her students over Zoom and, and see what they were doing. And so I'm really excited by the different things, the new ways that motion capture is enabling people to do things that, you know, they normally would have had to have been in person, lots of people in a room, close contact that, that we really haven't been able to do lately. We found that with our film and kind of television and broadcast courses now, they've suddenly, because of virtual production being the kind of buzzword at the moment, we have, and with the, you know, improvements because we you know always used a virtual camera in motion builder but you know trying to if you give that to a, a dop or a cinematographer and try and get them to do what they do they couldn't quite they just don't see it so now with the virtual camera tools and that real-time aspect everyone's in and we're now working with our film production um our ba film course to start thinking about we're even talking about how we can work and do location audio recording. So we're tracking a boom mic and using spatial audio in Unreal Engine um, to teach you know, how to record and not record audio on a set because it's cheaper than having to take them out and get all the equipment out and go to somewhere and do it in a location. Whereas they can now 
recreate the same thing over and over and really get an idea where people are going wrong with these things. And it's just because we're able to track stuff and generate all of this stuff in real time. It's opening a huge amount of, of different areas of interest across our, our faculty and the wider university as well. Now you're talking about the dance classes. I remember like four years ago or two years ago, a teacher of high school uh, reached out to, to help them to you know, students, you know, 16, 17 years old kids using the system because they wanted to use in a performance class to, to show them, you know, how to improve uh, like uh, the cinematography process and, and the layout, you, you things like that. And what's amazing to see kids that don't have idea how to use, you know, Maya or things like that using a motion capture system just because it was fun. And they have uh, this experience about to, you know, uh, performance their own characters, they design and, and make a final movie, you know, and in motion builder, I, I can't imagine they can do now with, uh, you know, with uh, meta humans and in real engine will be amazing to see things made by kids on YouTube and things like that. Yeah, Jesse, I'm curious on your take. Actually, yeah, I was going to say uh, from Carlos's note there is that um, I actually teach uh, a STEAM summer experience um, every year for both 3D and 2D animation. And for the last couple of years that we had the system, I had the opportunity to take, you know, the students from high school in our class and throw them in a suit. And it's a really awesome experience because they've probably seen a system before they uh, know, you know, they've seen it work in, you know, films and, and games, um, but they've never actually been, you know, in front of the system or in a suit or even, you know, interacting with one of the actors or something like that. So um, just to add to that, like, it, you know, bring them on early and they get cooked and interested and um, they, they want to come back to, to Stout or somebody someone else, you know, to learn more about motion capture and get into it. So, yeah, I'm all for, you know, um, showing especially high schoolers because when i where i come, came from we had art classes and stuff in high school but i really wanted to get into 3d i really wanted to get into animation and stuff and so that's why i always you know i i've taught at my high school for like you know a couple of um workshops and stuff with 3d uh, because i want to kind of fill that gap of you know um showing students early on what you can do in 3d and also in motion capture I yeah really when like i the came into the industry In 2008, um, there was this stigma around motion capture as it wasn't quite an art form, right? It was mm -hmm. not just a tool either. It was a shortcut. You were kind of cheating by using motion capture. But really, it's an instrument, right? If somebody comes in and plays power chords on a guitar, does that mean they're not a musician? No, right? You can use the tool for anything, whether you extrapolate it into flamenco or a classic or whatever. You're still using the tool and how you use it right, ha has really changed and adopted to the point where some of the naysayers early on companies who I might not name who say that they were never associated with motion capture are now primarily using it, not just for camera tracking, but for other things, uh, yeah. which they discussed. Sorry, Nick, you were going to say. I was just going to say that I love that Carlos brought up just how much fun motion capture is. Um, I almost feel like there needs to be some kind of psychological study on the, what happens to the brain when someone gets in a mocap suit and sees their performance on the projection screen or big screen for the first time because universally I, I've, I've worked with professional dancers, I've worked with students, I've, I've worked with like ex-military special forces and it doesn't matter who they are. Once they're in that suit and they see their avatar on screen moving with them, they instantly like revert to like five years old and just have a blast yeah. kind of just like moving that character around and So and then it just becomes like this natural extension and you can even see people start to adapt, you know, that they'll might, you know, adapt their performance for that avatar. And um, it is definitely its own art form. Uh, it's it's that the blend of the technology as well as aesthetics uh, that all really needs to come together. And I, that's That's what I love about it anyway. And it kind of comes back to what you said. We've mentioned that democratizing because it's so much easier now to get amazing results instantly. You know, the, the volume, our volumes become more and more of a collaborative space through the years. There's more and more people coming in, more and more people trying new things. People are, are attracted towards it rather than a fear of it because it's so deeply, it's not so deeply technical anymore. We can do things that are instantly appealing. You know, we're working with our fashion department now 
you know, to try and sort of work through virtual influences. And also, you know, they're starting to use like Marvelous Designer and Clothe 3D to start doing their fashion design and really thinking digital, not physical for sustainability. And now we're able to get the fashion students to come in and wear their own digital collections and model for their digital collections. So like I said, this openness and the ability to invite people into the volume to kind of collaborate and work on different things has just got so easier and so much more scope to that through the years with technology developments. It's amazing. Yeah. It's interesting because I still feel that in conversations during random encounters, I used to say at a bar, it's been a while, um, but you, you tell somebody that you're in motion capture and some of them still kind of give you that curious look like, oh, I, I think I know what you're talking about. And you have to say the balls and the suits and people like, I, st I still don't quite get it, which is crazy to me with how prevalent motion capture is in much more than just animation, especially with the discussion uh, that we've had thus far. So uh, kind of for everyone, but starting with Carlos, maybe, how do you evangelize motion captures uh, to areas of the world or people that might not be aware of it uh, that are new to the industry? And then more on that, um, just kind of with the knowledge in animation, the knowledge about mocap and animation permeating uh, the zeitgeist for incoming students, how do you manage those expectations versus the reality? So there are people that don't know anything, how do you teach them? How do you explain it to them? And for the people that do know things, but expect this versus reality, how do you manage that? That's a very good question because uh, the experience in other countries, they don't have animation programs. You know, you need to start not just about to talk about motion culture, you need to start about teach animation, you know, in, in, in another countries, they are just starting to have a program related to animation. But the, the thing is, uh, these universities just need to take the experience about, you know, big universities like you have in, in, in the US, because this is the model that it's proof, you know, if you want to teach animation, like the big ones, you need to cover this, this and this. So uh, the thing started, you know, trying to make a program, animation program that includes a motion capture class uh, at least, you know, but the things has changed as now they are asking about how we can teach uh, these things related to virtual production in a, you know, a media or a communication degree. Uh, so it's difficult at the beginning. As you say, you need to start talking about this black suit with the balls that you see in the uh, making off of this movie, yes, this is the technology, but it's it's more like about to try to let them know that not everything in the world is keyframe animation, you know, because we used to teach here in Mexico and in other countries animation like we did 15 years ago, you know, the keyframing process, it's a classic process, but for sure for uh, emerging countries, they need to understand that the process can be automatized uh, with uh, technology like this. So it's the only way you can make a movie uh, if you want to do it just with a bunch of people and not uh, 200 people because we don't have big animation companies in South America, but that's why a motion capture have a nice uh, position in universities in Latin America because help students to have a very nice project uh, with just uh, six months of work. And, and that's how universities understand, yes, this is the thing we need. We need to teach these things because it's the only way to have amazing projects, great results, and achieve uh, the position to be like the big universities in, in America, you know? Yeah, absolutely. We do a lot of demonstration, you know, it, it's, it's, it's about getting people into the space and seeing it. That's when I, like Nick said, that sense of wonder that people kind of go, oh, it's there and it's there, I can see it moving. It's getting people in the space. And that's what we, I've done a lot, obviously not in the last year or so, but every time we have open days at the university, we do open sessions for um, prospective students. We do open day sessions for local colleges, you know, higher education so we get them in and we show them how cool it is to be at university and if we can get them in a suit we will but it's it's about showing and letting people come and see it and experience it firsthand um, and then because we've you know because we've got a studio that's open for people now when the graphic design course are showing people around our building they come in and have a demo the fashion course does the film course does the illustration course now does we've had and it's about we keep keep 
enticing people in and saying, you know, yes, we can use mocap on a on an illustration project. Why not? You are a, you're on a BA animation course. You're teaching traditional animation, but you can come in and get the best reference you've ever wanted. And it's you've got to be good at pitching and knowing, you know, what you how you can pitch to all of those different people, or just admit and go, I have no idea how we're going to use a suit on an architecture course or something similar. But now I know exactly how we would. And it's inviting them in and just being open and getting people in to experience it. And I think then it follows naturally after that, we've, we've found. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in real quick. When we first got the, the system set up, um, we wanted during our senior show to show off a live demo of the system itself and how it works. And um, it was quite surprising that when we were doing the live demo, we had, you know, um, kids or parents or even students that are in the system or, or here at uh, Stout uh, walking through and looking at the live demo. And we even encouraged them to just take one of our live props and just move it around in the, in the space. And you can see like once they took a, a, you know, a hand of that prop and they were looking at the screen, there's that instant connection of, you know, wow, I'm doing this. I'm moving this, you know, virtual digital thing. Um, and it's, it was funny because some, some, some or most of them are like, oh, I want to keep on playing with this, but we didn't give it to somebody else to give it a try as well. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I've done that lots. I've, I've always taken the mocap <laughs> system and setting it up somewhere else and doing demos. We have an end of year show every year, or we did have, and we do them online now. And we've got an atrium in our building. So I would, I would take 12 of the cameras down and set them up and we'd have live mocap running with music and next to our TV show. And it is, it's, the, it's, if you're passionate about it and you sell it in the right way, people follow. And I'm still, you know, I've been doing, I've been teaching mocap for 17 years now and it still puts a smile on my face. The, <laughs> the technology is going, still makes me smile and I'm still passionate about it. And, and hopefully that comes across and drives people towards it. And that's, that's getting the students enthused, getting our alumni to talk and come in. It's that whole kind of full circle approach of, always being active and doing what you can and it keeps on evolving too we, we keep on doing more and more stuff with it um we got facial uh, uh tracking animation stuff like that which um has been become a lot more accessible and, and easier to use um and just so many other things we just again last year got finger tracking in the vicon too like things just keep on evolving and just there's so much more you can do year after year with a with a system like this yeah, certainly those big kind of almost gimmicky wow moments will break the wall instantly for any anybody that doesn't know anything about it. That, like you say, that that first interaction, and, and as Alex was saying earlier, the first time you put someone in suit, they always wave to themselves on the TV. It's like we've got a big TV up in the thing. I don't know why. It seems just instinctive. Um, but I, I I I was fortunate enough. Uh, prior to the pandemic, to take my three children into our motion capture studio and put them in suits. Um, the two-year-old not didn't cooperate enough to manage to assign him to anything. Apparently a T-posing two-year-old is quite tricky. I tried, um, but my elder kids instantly loved it. And that ability to go all the real-time stuff now and the ability to drop a 3D model into Motion Builder or Unreal and drive it directly is, is huge because instantly they were Spider-Man. And that's all. That's you're all, another all, character. You're, yeah, you're something They want to know more about it instantly. And I think once you get that wow in there, the, the other bit that, that Jeffrey sort of questioned was how do you then manage the expectation? But actually, once you get the wow, folks are really quite willing to put in the, the hard work to get to what their expectation then is of what they've seen. So as long as you can get that initial wow, the excitement carries through, I've found at least and with the students that really engage with motion capture and go, I, I want to know how all this works. It's that initial excitement and that, that peak that, mean, that makes all the hard work seem not so much like hard work, it, it's, it's that fun and excitement towards, I want to do what they did because it was cool. I've, I've seen too that it, it definitely opens creativity as well. So it, once you get over the that initial wow factor, then you can see the gears start spinning. But like, what can I do with this now? And we've had dancers come in and, and really realize that, you know, what if I brought in some some of my wire work crew? Like if I did leaps and like, can, can we do that? Oh yeah, yeah, we could do that. And and then, you know, we could transition from, you know, you could do this basic walk or run and then you could just like 
flick your foot and then we can transition that to you know some aerial piece and it, it doesn't take very long for novices to motion capture to suddenly visualize all the things they can do creatively with it because it's it's very freeing all of a sudden you know gravity isn't necessarily a limitation and you know what you might be able to do in a you know by yourself is suddenly not the limitation anymore and um and i think a lot of students from i just call it they get the bug um i have there's there's one student at least it's it's here right now Deirdre Lou and and it was just like okay you know we've been capturing people all the time let's get a dog you know and she reached out to the you know there there's a service dog in in the university and you know talked to the owner he's like can you can you just bring your dog would it be okay if we and you know next thing we knew we had like you know this big motion capture club meeting where the dogs in there and everyone's doing mocap with this this really cute cuddly dog also massive but uh it all of a sudden, it just it just seems to to just stoke the fires of creativity. It's like once once people get their head around, oh, I know how this is working, and that means like it's in the computer. And so then afterwards, we can edit it, and and it's just all of a sudden, literally, the sky becomes the limit. Yeah, in education, I think we're in a really unique place as well because we have, you know, obviously where our time constraints are, are, are you know, for teaching and workload, but we have we have a lot of playtime as i like to call it um r d time where we could we can we can try the latest feature in the software because we've got a bit of space we haven't got bookings in our studio meaning there's no spare time so we have a lot of we have a lot of r d and play time and that's important you know involving the students in that so they can try the latest feature that they've just read about yes let's get that running asap and and try and kind of do something with it and that's that's a really fun part of being in the university is that the playtime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it feels like uh, I use an analogy quite a bit when I'm talking about motion capture that I think that you guys touched on, right? You're all, uh, you're all teachers uh, as chefs in a kitchen, right? You've got all these different tools that you're trying to enable your students to use. And that's really just an access point. Once they get to know the tools, it's not about the tools anymore. It's about the things that they cook. It's about what they create. And it definitely helps when you've got a really, really good range oven like a Vicon and not an easy bake oven. But you know, that that's not necessarily here nor there. It's about what what they create with it uh, that ends up being, I think, the most important. Um, and I think that that lends into uh, the next topic question, um, right? We've we've come out of a really interesting time where uh, demand for content has skyrocketed, and people are just reaching the end of Netflix as they used to reach the end of the internet in the mid 2000s, right? And so as the demand has skyrocketed, how have universities adapted their courses, right? Uh, to, to meet the demand in games, VFX and, visual, and virtual production. And have you changed any processes based on the nature of communication? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I guess, I mean, I'll, I'll share that um... At the same time, all of these motion capture technologies and the and the components that feed into it, and then also pick it up downstream in the pipeline, as they were really um, becoming more and more accessible, the uh, the VR world was also growing very rapidly, and so we kind of took all of that and pulled it together. So where we've traditionally have had a game design program that focuses on you know creating games and we've had an animation program a visual effects program uh, it, we saw an opportunity to create a new program and it's it's VR and immersive media that pulls in components of all of those disciplines and brings them all together so for us virtual production motion capture virtual reality augmented reality and then you know full dome projection and projection walls all of that all work together and it's it's not traditional visual effects it's not traditional animation and it's not game production game design but we're using game engines but we are using visual effects techniques we're using animation techniques so one of the things that that happened for us we launched it back in 2018 is just an entire major that really just focuses on bringing all of these tool sets together and leveraging them for whole new categories of projects 
Yeah, we've done similar. We've got one starting or well, started last year called Creative Computing. So it's it's kind of a bit of a, a smorgasbord of everything. And a mocap is now in it and virtual production and VR development. Um, and again, you know, it's now that all of our game students now have got jobs opening up in virtual production. You know, the, the, the industry is crying out for, you know, Unreal Engine and Unity game engine artists. And it's now they've just got more open. It's just more and more doors. And it's it's difficult for us to try and react. I don't know what it's like in US universities, but in UK universities, it takes us quite a while to get a new program accredited and set up and running. So we can't be quite as agile. And that's where having these, these kind of mix, mix and match, for want of a better term, degrees is really good because that allows us to be reactive and agile within the course. Um, rather than having to try and establish a new program and get it accredited and get it in place. There's area within our courses. And that's one thing I've definitely seen us doing over the last few years more and more is those open-ended kind of modules and kind of programs where it allows experimentation. It allows the music students to talk with the mocap, the game and the animation and this collaborative stuff through just because of it being easier and there's this skill. But the one thing, you know, we find is that um, there's a shortage in Unreal Engine developers out there at the moment. Um, so we need to widen our games course to create more Unreal Engine developers and Unity developers for, to meet the demand, especially in VR, virtual production. It's, it's huge at the moment. It's struggling to try to keep up with the amount of demand that there is for these kind of skills, this, this real mix and match of all these skills of bringing different elements together. And, you know, that's been, it's a tricky one to keep up with. Yeah, as you said, Alex, uh, uh, we are having these problems, uh, you know, in the university now because we we have to, uh, we have this responsibility to about to cover the demand of the industry needs with programs that covers the content that industry it's uh, asking for. But the problem is how the technology changes so quick, and and university degrees can change so quick to have specific topics related to, as you said, real time graphics or uh, how the students don't want to see, you know, uh, programming or things related to it. But now is no real engine needs to cover also uh, production techniques and VFX techniques. So you need to uh, be bold with uh, programming skills and things related to it. And as universities and educators, we have this this challenge to to try to uh, prepare the industry to have the people with the skills needed. Uh, to cover the positions in, in, in industry, particularly here in Latin America, I, we have the chance to uh, maneuverate and have, uh, you know, a, this um, a way to plan because technology takes some time to be here. Uh, we don't have big ILM companies here, but uh, obviously we want to to check what the things are going there up there and then uh, prepare the programs to have uh, the skills needed for students. And uh, the funny thing is uh, we want to show the technology that it's easy, that it's uh, very um, funny to use, but what was how we was talking a few minutes ago, but we need to show them that it's not quite easy. It's not magic. You know, you need to do things like uh, programming, retargeting, et cetera, et cetera. So motion capture, it's an amazing tool, but there's a lot of things behind to make it work great as, as big companies do. So this is the big role for educators to don't try to confuse the people about uh, things are easy, but no, it's not quite easy. <laughs> Alex is spot on about the demand for students that are skilled in this area. And so that's really exciting time, you know, to, you know, as I'm watching students develop their skills and, and just, you know, focus and develop a whole new industry for them to actually go get their jobs in. Um, we've had, we, Drexel has a, a program, a co-op program where students will take six month stints where they have no classes and, but they're expected to work in industry. And broadly, usually, and ostensibly, that's for the students to learn from employers, you know, go out, learn something, you know, from your employers and then come back and, and take some more classes and go out and, and work for an employer again. And um, we're seeing students get hired by companies that want to learn from the students. So the student is already well versed in Unreal Engine, motion capture, all these technologies that architectural companies, uh, 
real estate development companies, retailers, even aerospace and uh, museum space. There's just all these industries that are suddenly really interested in this tool set. And ultimately, we're seeing students that, you know, for all the students that we have that go, end up at, you know, top tier studios, whether it's visual effects, animation, game design, we have every bit as many students that are going into other industries like architectural and aerospace, automotive, even, you know, law, you know, and doing uh, forensic reconstructions. And so um, it, the the amount of demand there is just in the world, like when we say the industry, it's not just entertainment anymore. Uh, the amount of demand is really, really exciting to see. Just to, just to add a question to this topic from Andrew Summer, he had said in the scope of universities teaching motion capture versus the industry, what do you think is the biggest soft skill that students lack? Um, which I think is interesting and lends to this discussion, right? I'm not sure it's necessarily lack, but certainly need to to build upon. As as an uh, as an animator working with motion capture and motion capture volume, having an actor is that direction. Because obviously, when you when, when you're animating a character or you're working on the motion capture data outside of that, you know potentially what you want to do with it. You've got your storyboard or your animatic or whatever you've produced, and you know where you're going. But quite often, I think. The students are perhaps afraid to go actually that's not what I wanted from the performance I would like this 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 and this I think that co that confidence to know that they're the they're in control of their shoot and that that element of of talking through what they do want what they need and actually talking to talent and making sure that the talent understands what they need is is probably something that I, I wouldn't say they lack but I think it's something that they need to develop and further kind of build their skills in in order to have an easier time and the, the, the hardware and the, and the and the software that we've got is so good now that almost any shoot that comes out the back is is ready to go it's workable and you you almost can get away with and, and i certainly do just lobbing animation straight into engine without really doing much on them just for like quick pickup stuff and yeah i can see all the little things but a lot of people look at it don't necessarily see them but then what I'm looking at is going. Hmm, the performance wasn't good enough. I'd, I'd want more of a more of a push on on that run, or more of a, a weight shift here, and I want a bit more character from from the from the attacks and things. And it's, it's at that point now. And I think having that little bit as they go into a shoot and knowing what they want and that confidence to to talk a tal uh, the, the talent through getting what they need is is, is key. Yes, yeah, Stuart, I, I was just going to jump in and, and say that was almost exactly what I was going to say, too, from my experience. And from a really short story, um, I had one of my students directing um, a performer uh, in the space, and they were constantly trying to say, no, I want this. No, I want this. No, I want this. And I finally told them, get up and show them, like get up and actually do it and show them exactly what you want to do in the space, because it's much different directing motion capture than it is video production. Um, because it's, I think it's a little bit more physically interactive um, between the director um, and the performer. Yeah, and, and it's really nice when you get, you know, we've been lucky enough to get, you know, quite experienced mocap actors come down and actually work with our students for some of their work. And that's really nice to see because the actor encourages the student to kind of talk about what they want because they'll just go it's on a bit of paper and it's yeah it's just open it's just opening up with a client and working or opening up with a performer and those like I said the soft skills is just working in that studio environment and knowing when it's okay to say something and when it's not okay to say something and it's those people skills and just knowing to you know having the confidence to know what you want and to communicate it clearly um, and to not be afraid to try ideas as well. It doesn't just have to go to your shot list. You can also right. all of a sudden kind of, if something's going the way you want it to go, you can move off sideways. And, you know, we know we've got enough time in the studio to try some kind of like, you know, alternate takes and kind of, you know, navigate your way through it without being afraid to. And, you know, just going by numbers and then go, no thanks, it's all over. I mean, that confidence. Yeah, that casual organic element that comes out of a shoot, isn't it? You see the actor add something and you go, oh, actually, I quite like yeah. that. I'd like a yeah. little bit more of that. Um, one thing we did really well, and uh, Gavin Lewis, one of our, um, our staff team, is entirely responsible for this. So I can't take the credit. Um, he brought in somebody to teach our 
gave students a little bit of acting for motion capture, which whilst you know I said earlier, we kind of almost don't want game students in the suit, we want performers, but actually teaching them some performance tricks and all of the performance stuff helps them understand what the performer needs to understand and think. So um, the, 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 the tutor we bring in is really good at making them think about ignoring the space they're in and thinking about the world they, they want to be in for that character and all that sort of stuff. And we've seen a really big shift and actually quite very, very quiet individuals suddenly coming to life in these sessions. And then the next time they do a shoot, you can see it coming through. And that, that has been a, a big sort of um, a big impact that, that, that we've had with our students. So, yeah, but like I say, I can't take claim for it. <laughs> yeah. And again, uh, I just want to re reiterate, like we've actually had some some actors like in the space and be like, hey, can I try this? Because I think it might work better for what you need. And we just end up doing some extra takes um, because, you know, they're already in the suit. They're there and we could just go and run through them. Um, and yeah, it's been really good, like connection between director and actor, because um, on the like a standard film set, you know, it's very like this is what the director wants and this is what's going to happen. And most of the time, if not all the time, the actor has no choice in what happens um, in it. So I think that is much, much different interaction um, from director to actor in that sense. I've, I've been yeah, lucky think... enough to, to be on commercial shoots and in different studios in the UK and and see that different dynamic between a you know a a, a very strict film production yeah. film shoot uh, where it, there's a very there's a chain of command and, a, and you know you don't talk to the wrong person you know you, you have to know who to talk to and who you're allowed to to really open fun shoots with different games companies and that's a really important thing to try and expose students to is that that the variation that they're going to find out it's not always going to be fun because you might walk into one shoot and start talking to some guy in the corner and realize that's the director and you're not supposed to talk to him there's a chain of command it's giving them those very real world experiences they need to have and that's one of the things i've been really keen to do is to get as much of a range into our studio be it commercial work be it you know from different clients and things um and it's that it's it's knowing that you know there's there are rules on times there's not but it's that flexibility to be able to adapt and read a room and read the people that you're with. Because, you know, we know, we all know a mocap studio is a very dynamic place to work, or it can be a really regimented place to work. And it's knowing to, how to read that and knowing when to have the confidence to step forward and when to have that confidence to just hold back and maybe wait for that opportunity to put an idea in the ring. And that's the, that's the hardest part because that's, that's kind of life skills. It comes with experience. Yeah. Just to add a, just a quick note too, is that um, I, when we first got the system and everything, one of the key missions or key things that I wanted to include in, you know, the process of the system is whoever is going to be in the suit, whoever's, you know, working with props or whatnot, the first thing and most important thing is to make sure that they feel comfortable in what they're doing and feel comfortable in the suit and making sure that it's a good experience for them. Because especially here in the Midwest, it's probably the first time they've ever seen a system like this in person or even first time putting a suit on like this. And I think you guys probably know, uh, maybe first time, you know, folks that put it on, it's, it's very different than, than what you're kind of envisioning. Um, and it feels much different too. So um, most of the time we introduce them to the suit first before even doing the, the, the session um, and making sure that they're like, are you okay doing this in front of people being recorded? You know, it's such a tight suit and everything um, because it, it's important to make sure it's a good experience for that person. And I think this is part of the role to be a good motion capture teacher, you know, because it's not the same if you teach just Maya on Unreal on a screen and you don't know if the, the kid is just watching Facebook in the computer. In this case, you need to uh, make the, the kids to have a uh, teamwork to improve the, the way they uh, do things together, who will be using the computer, who will suit the, the, the character, uh, the actor, etc. So uh, as motion capture teacher, you need to uh, improve the way the, the kids, uh, well, not the kids, the, the students <laughs> work together, you know, uh, but but it's the difference about to to just teach another software in, in the computer. It's a it's a team effort. It's a yeah. team event. It's not just one or two people running it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Alex's point about bringing in, you know, outside work into the stage or getting involved in outside work is a great one uh, because I, I have a feature film 
uh, visual effects background, and there just is no industry that operates like that. I mean, it, it's it's its own thing. Well, I mean, game studios, visual effects studios, animation studios. I mean, these these major production uh, facilities. You you don't have as you're con contributing. You you need to do your job. You need to do it well. You need to do it reliably, and it's down to the level of detail. Like your files have to have exactly the right names, and it's you know teaching that to students who don't have that context is is a really important aspect of of the educational process, and it's not simply about you're not just a cog in a machine. It's not like, you know, 1890s industrial era, just, you know, you move this lever a hundred times. You're, you're expected to bring a level of creativity, but not be too wildly creative that you've gone out beyond the scope of something. You know, ultimately, what I try to share with the students is that what you're striving to be is a force multiplier for everybody else on the team. It's not, it's not about you, and it's not just about you only doing what you have to do, but it's how you contribute to making the entire team more effective, more productive, higher quality. And so it, it's a very, very difficult skill to teach. It's not something that really gets taught in the classroom. And, and I think that is one of the things that is unique to motion capture is that that is, it's a very visceral experience and, and people do have to work together. It's, it's very rare that you know, you can get much effective motion capture done if you just go in by yourself, put on your own suit. It's it's possible, and I know there's lots of demos, and and and, and we have people that do that. But it's so much more productive when you've got, you know, someone one, running witness cameras, someone's you know focused on running the the ca capture system, somebody's just watching for fallen markers, and you know the whole team works much more efficiently, gets much better results when they're. You know, contributing together. It does seem like a short straw when you've got someone on the continuity spreadsheet, though, and then they want to be operating. It's like, what you're going to have to sit here and fill out a spreadsheet to say what happens is like, no, you need to sit here and keep an eye on the shoot. We need the notes for afterwards. It's a crucial role. And it's getting them to understand all of those different parts contributing to that whole. It's not just about the flyboy, you know, I'm operating the mocap system, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. This, that continuity can be just as important as someone operating the system because down the line you go what happened on that take what happened on what happened there oh I, I got that on the spreadsheet yeah the marker came off it stuck to this actor it did this it did that and it, it's 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 yeah it's getting them to play all of those different roles in a studio as well can be tricky in you know university because you've got to get those caliber of projects that drive that and always trying to have something that drives the, all those different roles to be in and it's just something you know I've brought into our program is we try and recreate a shoot for them when they're coming in to be as much like the real world as possible, depending on what they demand and you know what project they're coming in with. But we make them be regimented and, and swap around in the roles that they do as well. Yeah, I was just going to say creative problem solving is key, um, especially in a team kind of format. Just uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, we did a motion capture shoot for one of our um, animation production teams uh, for the animation production class that I'm teaching now. And one of their shots, um, the main character is on a tight rope uh, walking. And I said, if you try to do just standard walking, you know, foot after foot on a flat surface, it's not going to look the same. And so we decided to just get a, a standard two by four put it on the ground and have them stand on it because that's a much better uh, feeling. Uh, it's going to look a lot better, a lot more genuine. Um, and so, yeah, creative problem solving, even something as simple as just putting a board down for a prop. I will add one more little thing that, that students should benefit from. It's just that little bit of a anatomical knowledge of which parts of the body don't move when you rotate your arms and your legs to make sure the amount of times I've seen markers for knees, elbows, and particularly shoulders, just slightly out of place and it's moving around. You're going, mm, that limb shouldn't do that. And then when you look, it's just it's just on soft tissue rather than a bony landmark. Little things like that. It seems like throwaway. And the, the first time you marker anybody, it's gonna like the, the very first time you marker a, a, a performer, it's gonna be pretty terrible. So um, you know, we can give as many pictures as we like, or like we, we had a 3D printed little like sort of statue with all the little markers on that was really quite cool. But even with that, you know, 
that mod, you, the person in the suit doesn't match physically the, the little model. So yeah. the practice and the understanding of what it is you're aiming for is key as well for, for and the, you've got the to, technical you've, aspect. You've got to get up and close personal with people when you're marking them up. And, you know, yeah. you see some of the students, they're absolutely terrified of going near. Someone. Yeah. I remember we had, we had a, one time we were doing, so we did some belly dancing motion capture and this, this German lady called Heike, six foot two German belly dancer. And she's kind of not body shy at all. But all these kind of the computer game student lads just, well, no, you put that mark. I'm not going, oh, am I all right to do this? And it's just like, look, we're in a mocap studio. You've got permission to be close and put markers on it. it but it is, it's a, that's another skill in itself is knowing, you know, comf feeling comfortable going close to people and knowing how to approach them. You can't just go on and, and put a marker in certain areas without asking permission first, or at least be a bit yeah. careful. <laughs> I just want to add too, like we we created when we first got the system a nice set of posters, one for front and back of marker placement and where it is. But just like what Stuart said, and and also Alex is that um, you have to feel around sometimes, especially like on the elbow or something, to know where those markers are going to go. So it's it's going to be more hands on. Like you can use those posters or like. You said the the model there as reference and it kind of helped you out of general location, but you actually had to, you know, touch and actually, you know, interact and put it on the actual actor to actually know where they go. It's really fascinating to hear the nuances of how you guys strive to find a balance between teaching people the tools without getting lost in the tools because they need to have creative output. And it actually covered pretty much my last two questions as part of the discussion there, right? Like one of the biggest takeaways it sounds like uh, uh, from you guys as educators is to try to help the students understand the trees in the forest, but also be able to see the forest through the trees, right? It's, it's easy to get lost, but you have to recognize that there's uh, a whole team assembly that goes into creative outputs. Um, so I'm gonna quickly launch a poll that I think will lend into uh, the end of the discussion here. Um, Considering we've touched on so many things about motion capture and animation in academia, one of the big things that I wanted to talk about was a little bit of the vision of the future. Um, and we've touched on bits of that as well. Uh, but I think I'll ask an open-ended question of maybe you can tell us one of your favorite stories of motion capture that's happened or and or tell us a little bit about your personal vision for the future of the industry uh, with motion capture as the cornerstone or or otherwise and just kind of open up uh, the end of the discussion with some more personal details yeah i'm happy to start with a, a bit of a crazy story if you like so we the first time that we brought performing art students into into our stage as um as part of a module they take to experience a lot of digital media so they do some voice acting they do some um some motion capture with us um, we gave um, we gave the performers a, an option of what three D character they would like to be um, to be their representation for the video that we would hand to them to take for their reflection and all their other work. And um, we had three lads: one who wanted to be a chicken because I had a chicken model, and he thought that would be great fun. One who wanted to be a troll, and another one that just was quite happy being a normal human. And they that they chose these, and they came back the next week to do the shoots. They go away and prepare a performance for it. And I was not quite prepared to see a six foot five chicken chasing a troll around a mocap studio. Um, it was it possibly the weirdest, but my most favourite shoot I've ever done because we we scaled the chicken up so that it was the right height, so that everything in Motion Builder kind of tracked which I thought was gonna be quite odd. And I was a little bit apprehensive to let them do this, but he performed a great chicken. Um, I, I, forget, I forget the guy's name, but he was really, really tall guy. He was perfect chicken. Yeah. And they they built a three part narrative story for a troll, a chicken and a human. And it was odd, but it was hilarious. And so there was, there was no foul play? Uh, no, there was some very odd, unfortunate moments where model sizes didn't quite match up. And I'm fairly sure at one point the troll's head disappeared inside the wrong end of the chicken. Um, but it still sits with me as the most bizarre performance I've seen that was performed really well. So even, even watching the video back, it kind of made sense what was going on and you could see the narrative 
the troll and the human trying to chase down this giant prize chicken. And it was bizarre, but I, I still, I, I love that that's what we can bring to people because it didn't matter. It was very much for their experience. We weren't doing it for a game or a serious film project or anything like that. It was experience the studio, experience the volume, experience performance. And yeah, it was, it was odd, but it was great. And I think talking to all you guys, and it's awesome to, to hear the kind of things that you love, but sometimes that fun is, is what, is what carries you and drives you back to going to play, isn't it? We had a similar one with, we had a similar one with someone in a T-Rex model. There was an old motion builder model of a T-Rex that was always brought out to kind of show difference. And obviously with a T-Rex, you don't T-pose, that's a T-Rex pose, <laughs> a T-Rex a T-pose. And we got the guy in, in, the, in the suit and it was during the break that was the best. I love seeing people being tracked when they're not in performance mode, when they're just, they're, they're switched off and they don't realize they're being tracked and they're still on a screen. And it was amazing to watch a Tyrannosaurus Rex stand there and have a discussion with the movement director, taking his directions and a conversation, just stood there with his arms folded and like nodding their head. And we recorded it as a take and it was just a brilliant thing, but it was, it was that thing of people not embodying a T-Rex and just being a normal person but you've got this beautifully moving kind of T-Rex model generating it. And it's just those kind of like those, those, those found moments are always really good fun on a stage. <laughs> Talking about to do mock-up of uh, funny things in, in weird conditions. I remember uh, some years ago, a students wanted to capture uh, a woman doing pole dance, you know? So the thing was, this was a, a Catholic university. So for them was like a very <laughs> uncomfortable thing because moral and ethic things uh, related to it. Uh, and obviously the problem was that uh, I didn't know that uh, pole dancers need the skin to attach to the metal tube. So the, the, the mock-up suit uh, was not able to help the woman to, to you know, the, the, do the, the magic about their dance. And we needed to do it, you know, in the skin. So we didn't have a special tape for skin and was a mess because the, the, the markers fall all the time. So it was very funny. First for the uh, university authorities say that this was uh, some kind of weird uh, conditions for a Catholic university and the skin thing was another big, big problem, but it was so funny. <laughs> So uh, earlier I had mentioned about, you know, the creative possibilities that motion capture opens up. And I, d I do recall a group of students at one point deciding that they would actually just stuff a mocap suit with like blankets and stuffing and fully marker it up and then just throw it around the room doing mocap. So a literal rag doll simulation. And they, they were pulling it on strings and throwing it across the room. Um, there was a choreographer also that had a uh, a vision for uh, two family members fighting over a child or something. And so it was like this very, it was a, basically a doll made of bungee cords. And we had to marker that up. And, you know, the dancers would lean back and they'd be pulling on it like a tug of war. And the, like the markers would just expand and contract. And the, those those were definitely interesting takes and there was there was there was a good bit of cleanup for those but it never ceases to amaze me the uh the, the creativity that like someone says you can can you do this and wow i've never thought of that before because i'm always thinking about how do we get the cleanest data possible how do we get the markers exactly in the right space and uh i think actually last year i had a uh, a grad student uh that wanted to do deconstructive motion capture. So she actually had a, a performer dancing with markers scattered all over the, the floor. And then at one point in the dance, she would just roll around on the floor and pick up extra markers and then be taking markers off. And so like when you played this piece forward, there was like this perfectly formed dancer doing her routine and then it would just like pieces would start shaking and then falling off and breaking off and of course you know my brain was just like no no this is not right this is 
bad data. But it was it was beautiful in the end. And she would do things, you know, playing it forward and backwards. So I'm, I'm just always amazed when someone new to the medium comes in and just thinks of something just completely off the wall like that. Yeah, and uh, my story is actually a little bit more, again, on the creative side, similar to Nick's. Um, actually, the first semester that we got the system, I had a, a small group of students that were kind of helping, uh, you know, getting documentation together and putting proper procedures together so that we can continue using the system efficiently in the future. And during one of our sessions, we were like, hey, what if, or, or during our live session, um, when we were messing around with Unreal Engine and doing live performance with it, we were wondering, you know, what if the performer was wearing a VR headset and was able to see through uh, a, a virtual camera at the same time? And it was surprising. We, we got it to work. It worked really well. And we actually learned some really interesting things about that process. One of them being is that if we try and match or when we did try and match the camera position to where the head is, um, or the virtual camera, um, it was disorienting um, in the VR headset. Um, and so we had to move the camera a little bit away from the head or a little bit above the head um, for the actor, the, the performer not to be shaky and like around like, whoa, what's going on because of disorientation. So again, that experimentation and, and pushing motion capture to what it can be, it's, it, it's just a fun experience and, and fun to see. Yeah, so I think that we've just uh, laid out the plot for season three of Love, Death, and Robots, right? We've got a troll and a chicken and a T-Rex being virtually directed by deconstructed ragdoll that's trying to learn S-factor classes in Carlos's story. Um, but yeah, that's those are all really fun. Um, so just being somewhat conscientious of time because I, I'm getting lost in the phenomenal discussion that we've been having so far, I did want to open up uh, some Q&A while we maybe talk about um, the, the latter part of my last question and uh, your visions of the future for the industry and in motion capture, just kind of, we've touched a bit on virtual production, which has been a tool set that we've used for so long, but it's taken on completely new meaning since the Mandalorian, a lot of these big LED wall stages and a, a massive investment from studios and, and universities uh, alike to try to empower that vision of the future. So maybe we can get your take on that or any alternate realities of the future uh, for the industry while we open up Q&A. So anybody, uh, any of the attendees, please feel free to put in a question uh, either in the chat or in the Q&A and we'll try to address it. It's okay, I, I, I could kind of answer that real quick, um, uh, or at least from my experience. Being in the, in the Midwest here, we do have some studios and even maybe some medium or even getting to larger size studios. And so, uh, again, going back to that stigma of, you know, what motion capture, you know, was, uh, you know, everybody looked at it as really highly um, expensive and hard to use or very technical. And being that that is changing uh, dramatically, uh, I'm really hoping that smaller studios or even independent studios are able to purchase, you know, some sort of system that they'd be able to use, even if it was for like reference or even like side projects or something like that. Um, just so that they can, you know, grow as a studio. Um, so I think it's been a big thing is like, who, who has a studio and uh, especially with those small or who has that uh, motion capture thing uh, set up um, with those smaller studios. And it's kind of a question mark for a lot of folks in this area. It's, we, we, we're trying to do it as well, because, you know, there's a, there's a real cost as a university to manning a mocap studio, same as in the real world. You've got to have staff in there, but it's trying to get as many people into that studio to kind of, like I said, term used before, lowering that barrier to entry, because the truth of it is not everyone is going to be able to afford a big optical mocap system. Right. Um, but it's, and it's, if you teach people that, then they go away and then their expectation is so high and they can't reach that. And it's it's about finding that, that use that doesn't just rely on X solution or Y solution and, and opening up to getting people in um, to see the potential of it. And I know, you know, the big question at the moment we keep getting asked about is, you know, how are indie filmmakers able to use virtual production? Because they can't afford a giant LED wall um, and all of this. There's obsession with LED walls at the moment. You know, <laughs> your average person is not going to be able to, you know, set up a big LED wall like the Mandalorian stage. And it's it's that's really important for me and us, I think, as educators is to, you know, we're not 
we're not subscribed to all these solutions that we have to push and it's being honest and being open and i think that's a really important part is to be honest and cut through the the bs and say look this is expensive that's not expensive try this try that and you know our role i really see moving forward is to kind of be the honest the the, the voice the honest voice in the middle of it all to kind of tell people what the real options are depending on where they're coming from into that into that production and what they can achieve easily and affordably and still find the results that they want and it's it, that's a difficult thing to do yeah. but it's really important that we do that yeah i mean we it's like saying hey this is you know a really nice system they're used here's the the basics of our found, uh, foundation of how to use it but here are some other systems or here are some other things that you can use other tools that you can use both hardware and software to get similar or get other um similar re results Yeah, Alex's point about, you know, not everyone's going to have a big motion capture studio and then they hear and they think, oh, this is just a really huge, really expensive, this is this is for those big movie studios, those big game studios. And I think a big part of what we can be doing as educators is sharing that this exists to other industries as well and that there's a lot of points of entry to this and there are a lot of applications for this. So uh, I've been doing some more work with our uh, our programs that are engaged in merchandising and, and retail management and what can be done with things like magic mirrors and how do we make better user interfaces and make better connectivity you know, from person to person uh, through these digital tools. And, and motion capture, digital humans are all components of that. And a lot of times it's about you know, getting over that initial impression, like, oh yeah, I've heard of motion capture. Isn't that that stuff that like the big movies do? Like that's that that that's nice. But you know, we're, we're just we're just this small thing. And um, well, yeah, no, but it's there are lots of avenues to to leveraging it, and and one of them's here in the university. But there's other tools. There's other forms of motion capture. And uh, sometimes it's it's just getting someone to you know just try this little bit. It'll make you feel good. You know, <laughs> so just try it. Yeah, in line with that and the conversations uh, surrounding the democratization of the motion capture and the tool sets and the easier and more affordable accessibility. I mean, Alex, you talked about, yeah, it's, it's hard for somebody to get a massive optical motion capture system for a studio, but even with a small set of cameras and accessible software and free tools, you can do these things in a more distributed fashion. And we've seen that distributed workplaces are a big part of now and the future. And so we've got a good question from May over here. Um, do you think that there will be more small mocap studios popping up in places to accommodate for the recent transfer of many companies to total work from home? And she just wants, he or she just wants to know personal thoughts on that. I think, yes, this is, this is a funny question because um, I have seen a lot of companies who started to uh, think on get the small mock-up setup just to start to do content, not for TV, not for movie theater, just for because they want to have real-time content for some webinars or, you know, Instagram stories or Facebook stories. So I think this is going to be more popular now to have these small setups of virtual production. And I think it's the same story like 10 years ago when people ask about, I want to do mocha, but I don't have for a big system and, you know, recommend you to use a Kinect to start doing some stuff. And, and the story will be always the same. If you want to learn how to fly a plane, you start with simulators in your computer and someday you have the chance to fly a real plane and and things related to use uh, HTC Vive or another stuff that is very, very cheap now is just to introduce for democratic masses to to start to do mock-up or real or virtual production and big setups will be there always to 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 the you know big leaks of motion capture or virtual production even just recently you know nvidia with their broadcast you know gtc just recently the, the broadcast tools that is now doing you know quite robust skeletal tracking just from video and it's kind of you know, it's 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 a hard one to kind of think. You know, all right, is a th is it a threat? All of this AI and video based stuff is it a threat to optical motion capture? I don't know at the moment where it's all going to go with machine learning and kind of video based stuff. But at the moment, it's a great, like I said, the golden age where more and more people are using it as a tool and more and more people are experiencing it. Um, and for us as educators, that's great because it gives our students more 
opportunities for employment out there. But there's been a you know there's been a trend over the last you know decade of more and more smaller you know games companies buying their own setups rather than going to bureaus to do all of their big mocap. And that's been difficult for the big mocap studios, the bureaus to manage because more and more small stuff. But there's always a need. You know, there'll always be, all right, our system can't do that. So we can go here and do this. We can go. And it's finding that place and making sure that you've, you're you flexible in that place and don't pigeonhole too much um, in one way. But the home stuff's been really interesting with a certain inertial suit that's out there um, where people have been shipping it to people's homes to do stuff. You know, um, you know, I think some of my students, I could probably ship them a small mocap system and they could set it up and calibrate it. But it, it's, you know, knowing when the right tool is right for the job and not being stuck in that kind of, you know, or oh, you can only do it this way or that way. And sure. that's we've got to be impartial as educators and kind of allow people to do that. And then hopefully what that does is that brings the, the business to the optical mocap studios because they keep pushing that art and they're going to hit the ceiling and the limit. And it's always interesting to see where that ceiling and that limit is and, and where these different things come into place. Fascinating as, yeah. as a university to explore be, that. It would be nice to see kind of smaller service providers for smaller studios to be able to access for pickup animation and stuff like that. I've, I've heard um, anecdotal stories from studios that I won't name where, you know, they have a, they have a, a, a relatively small optical system that is in an office with their animators and when they want to use it, the animators have to move their desks. And, you know, that works for some pickup animations and they do, and they, they, you know, they'll have a day where they'll all agree not to work at their desks or whatever. And then once they've done their pickup stuff, they'll then go out to a big studio. But actually, I think it would be lovely to have a few more smaller options with the, you know, the, the expansion now of kind of tiered solutions with, you know, cheap as cheap solutions come available from, from yourselves, but also from other, other options and the optical and like the video tracking based things. If that tiered system exists, like, you know, you can always go to your local kind of motion capture provider for something quick and simple and easy. But when you need to be tracking a horse running around a, a studio, you probably can't do that in a, in a small unit, you might actually need a, a barn. And, you know, as, as your needs progress, like uh, Alex was saying, you can go to the bigger and bigger providers. And if you can get, if, indie studios can get that access and equally kind of students that leave um, educators and either want to set up their own studios or want to go into motion catch we've been very lucky that a lot of our students who have wanted to be sort of on the technical side of motion capture quite a lot of them have gone down to centroid and, and worked out now which has been amazing they've been a, a great kind of employer of our graduates um, and a lot of them have now kind of moved on and into different places but more little pop-ups can only be good for both students and the industry in, in my opinion anyway if i can jump in real quick uh the other thing too is that on the flip side and i think we mentioned this before of the students after graduating or getting a job in motion capture that the studios or the employers learn from them and their experiences and what they do and so if you have those smaller studios um, that hire those students that have prior experience with motion capture but the studio doesn't have a, a system yet um, that student can introduce that studio to their experiences and and show them you can still do this stuff under a reasonable budget and then again encouraging uh, other studios even smaller studios to to get a system yeah nick your thoughts yeah i i think you know alex had mentioned the um you know the, the inertial suits and essentially each inertial suit is its own small mocap studio you know, and, and there are so many people out, the VTubers, right? So they're, they're putting on a suit, they're in their home, and they're puppeting, animating a digital character and streaming it. And, you know, some of them are doing it just for fun. Others, you know, started out as, you know, I just need to learn this technology. And then they ended up essentially building a whole company around it about their streaming. Um, so I think, you know, the if of this question has uh, that's already transpired i mean there are just so many small motion capture facilities there are optical ones i mean in our college you know we have r2 in the uh in the media college but the the nursing college has a vicon system you know and, and that's in the you know physical therapy area and they, they're using uh for you know range of motion studies and things like that and 
coupling it with pressure plates and and it, there's just so many mocap studios that are around it there's so much utility to the technology so i, I just th see it expanding more and more yeah this is this has been really really fascinating and we, we've got a quick question here uh from an anonymous attendee that's asked has the software become easier to teach as it's become less complex and that's a curious one because uh it, it feels like something where you'd you'd be able to focus on more things because the software is easier, but then you'd lose the, the background that goes into what made that software easier to this point that you still have to address with every student. But curious on your take uh, as we wrap up. Yeah, I mean, so I'll just start and let everyone else finish. But the, uh, the idea of problem solving is just always there. There's always problems to be solved. And so even though the front end user interface looks prettier, the buttons are in just the right place and it, it's ostensibly easier to get through a calibration process, well, that gives you more time for more motion capture and it gives you more time for more creative uses of that and more experimentation. And then that experiment didn't turn out the way we really thought it would. I wonder why. Let's dig in under the hood. What, what's the calculation going on there? Is there a way that we could you know, maybe make a Python script to automate something that makes this a little bit more efficient, more repeatable, et cetera. So there's always more to be done. And I think that each time we improve the user interface, every time we make one thing easier, it just gives us more time to dig into something else new. Yeah, and it shifts that technical focus because now, you know, you can get amazing real-time rock solid solves running and streaming it out but now you've got to get good retargeting set up you've got to make sure that your characters are being driven so it shifts the focus i'm finding will shift there's always a deeply technical area to do in this there always is and that's great for the problem solving so yes you can get working more quickly but then you'll just it, it's opening another box of, of another set of problems you can focus on now and it just kind of shifts around but yeah getting started is much much easier you know, remembering using Vicon IQ years ago and, you know, having to sit there and do your calibration and load that in and then go waiting, waiting for results. Yeah, that waiting for thing. Oh, yeah, we'll have that. And you'll be able to see that in a couple of hours or whatever once we've cleaned it up, that immediacy. But then, like I said, it's always a set of problems that you're going to start focusing on. That, that problem solving shifts to new areas all the time. So you take, take away with one and give with another. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember my very first shoot that I ever did on motion capture and the data. Um, what I got out of the back to play motion builder was just effectively point helpers and just little green boxes that were, so, some of them were named, some of them were not. And it's like for every take, I was doing half an hour to an hour to, to get that data to something I could even get anywhere near a character. And that barrier of, of going in was, was really off putting for many people. Now that barrier and the, the, the simplicity of the software and that simplicity of going from I've walked in the studio to I'm recording data, that's got so easy. And I think it's not, I think it's just shifted what we teach. Like I no longer have to teach people how to label 60 markers and that are just green squares in Motion Builder and understand that possibly you put the you, you one down in the wrong direction. So actually you now need to think of that way as up. Um, or anything like that. You know, we don't have to worry about that anymore. So don't have to teach that. So I think it's changed what we teach more than made teaching easier. There's always more to teach. And it just means we can teach more kind of higher level thinking and creativity. And that ultimately, I think that's what we all seem to enjoy teaching is the creativity and the, and the enjoyment and the, and the problem solving rather than the, here's a really mundane repetitive process that will drive you mad. Right. So it removes the barriers so you guys can get back to teaching that balance that we've always been talking about, where you don't want to get lost in all of the tools, but you want to be able to empower your students to be the creative directors, producers, and animators of the future. Fantastic. I, I feel like I have so many more questions and so many more things that we want to talk about, but uh, uh, we've, we've covered a lot. And I really want to thank you guys for your time. Um, I think I'm going to pass it over to Alicia to give us a bit of an outro here, but uh, I don't know, at some point, maybe Nick kind of, uh, we can we can see what's going on as you've joined us from the future. 
in your in your studio over there. Oh man, I want to know about those screens. <laughs> this yeah. is the present. This is this is. Uh, I uh, I guess I practice what I teach. So um, I, I do all my uh, streaming from inside Unreal Engine. So yeah, the screen, all of that. This is. You know my oh. basement. <laughs> it's almost <laughs> I'm disappointing. In closet. I, I know <laughs> it is right, right. So you know this is this is where you know I've got this reflective desk in front of me is is in Unreal and the screens are uh, in Unreal and it's it's just something that's a little more than a, a Zoom background. But then you know again it can be expanded into this uh, big 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 space. The uh, I guess the one thing that um, I, if I'm allowed to share my screen. That's that's kind of amusing. Is that uh, the the screens themselves here are, are screen capture video over Ethernet feeds using Newtik NDI, um, and it lets me s share my screen by switching cameras in Unreal. So these, you know, camera one, camera two is this this wide angle view, and you know, many thanks to the Smithsonian for their space shuttle. I hope they don't miss it. Um, the you know, I could switch with these between these cameras, but what I could also do is down in the basement <laughs> are these two cameras that are just looking at cards from the two different camera feeds. So if I want to look at the Mac, I can switch to camera five and it's just looking at the video feed from, from the Mac so that I can you know, switch around and, and play with that. Or I can, uh, I could probably set up a feedback loop now if I look at the Unreal Engine <laughs> uh, screen. So I'll just kind of go back upstairs here and uh yeah so that's uh that's that's it this is i again i mean just like motion capture itself i, I think that you know the the downstream pipeline is becoming more and more accessible I mean, it, it's the fact that companies like epic are making so many of these tools available at no charge you know the uh, Un unreal engine you know for creators you can you can just get it you they're the metahumans um and it means that when we use our motion capture now the students are able to produce much more compelling imagery uh, much faster with uh you know less uh monetary investment it makes it all much more accessible so it's, it's a really exciting time very cool definitely need one of those yeah, I feel like that's actually, you, you must have the secret technology that allows everybody on NCIS to enhance. Is that what it is? It doesn't work when I do it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, don't th I don't think that's a thing yet. Uh, there's probably some office somewhere with a machine learning system that maybe does that by now. But It kind of reminds me of my Minority Report with those transparent uh, yeah. screens a little bit, yeah. <laughs> so the, the funny thing is that they exist only so because I look stupid and that, you know, you can probably see yourselves on this hologram in front of me here because I have a physical screen for that computer over here and it's off camera. And so if I look at the Zoom meeting and there's nothing actually there that I'm looking at, I just look kind of like an idiot, you know, just like I'm looking at nothing. <laughs> so that's where the, the idea of doing these first came up. I was, well, this way I can show people that I'm actually looking at them. This is this is what I'm looking at and you're just seeing it from the backside. And, um, so they're, they're pretty nice. They're really hard to clean, you know, because the pixels just collect dust. Yeah. Well, thanks again, everyone. Uh, Alicia, maybe you can tell people where they can find this video and any more information that they want. Yeah, this was so interesting. I feel like I learned a ton. I say this, probably have said it to all of you at some point, but my emotion capture awareness came after my college days. So I always tell people that as soon as it's one of those things that as soon as you know about it, you start seeing it everywhere. Um, and this just doubles down on that. So, um, the stream is live now at youtube.com slash Vicon. I was just actually looking through our website and I think we have content, um, whether it's a case study or a press release with all of our panelists here today. So I'll post here, but it's Vicon.com slash news. You can find all of our case studies. Um, we have standard magazines going back to 2005. So tons of content there. I'll also include those links in the Zoom recording that you will get tomorrow. So that goes out to everyone who registered. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for joining us. Follow us on all of our social channels. Andy Ray had a wonderful tweet uh, that tags all of our panelists and the organizations. So go check us out at Twitter dot com slash bicon to connect with them. 
um, and we will see you at the next session. So make sure to follow the channels and the website for all the upcoming details.